So you don't know how to do it. Yeah, three. So, you are probably all intimately aware. You have a programming assignment due this evening at uh, 5 till midnight. Make sure it's in on time. Um, going through things. <laughs> Make sure it's in on time. Make sure it actually uploads to Moodle correctly. It's on you guys to double check your uploads, not on us. So I know the Moodle upload interface could be better, but do go back and double check after you think you've uploaded it to ensure it's actually been uploaded. Uh, you don't want to be getting late penalties just because you clicked the wrong button on Moodle. So do double check that it's uploaded. In addition to that, hopefully you've all signed up for your grading session for PA4 by now. If you haven't, we also are asking that you do that by this evening, so please do so. If you have a conflict, make sure you let us know by this evening. Uh, I will be far less sympathetic to trying to schedule lecture sessions to accommodate you at this time tomorrow. So make sure you take care of that sooner rather than later. Today we're actually going to spend the bulk of the course talking about the bulk of the class talking about your next programming assignment. That'll be released tonight. It's due a week from Friday, so you essentially have a week and two days to work on it. Uh, it'll probably take you at least as long as this programming assignment, if not a little bit longer. So start early um, and often. We'll open up for questions here on PA4 uh, in just a sec. Are there any general course questions or anything else hanging out there before we get into things? Okay. So, we don't have a ton of time to spend on it, but are there any quick PA4 questions that I could help you with in your last five hours of work? Any advice on how to implement all you? <laughs> so screwed. Let me Google that for you. Um, it's, it's the kind of thing where it's easy to make a mistake, but the concept should be pretty straightforward at least. So, Look up Kit Con. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Fine. Any other questions? Why doesn't mine work? It's a lot of people can send me that email. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know why each of your individual implementations may or may not work. I'm not quite that good. Um, in general, the name of the game is, I mean, the simulator can give you a whole bunch of debugging output. You can use printf statements. I mean, when I, when, when I solved this problem, the biggest thing for me was just making yourself aware of exactly what's going on. Most mistakes aren't necessarily that you're doing the wrong thing, it's that you're not doing what you think you're doing. Uh, you've made some implementation error. The ideas aren't so hard, the implementation is easy to screw up. So if you're having trouble or you think something should be performing better than it is, my recommendation is use the debug output on the simulator, put in your own printf statements, Try to get a feel for exactly what's going on, um, because that'll generally elucidate whatever silly mistake is occurring. Anything else? Cool. So your last programming assignment, program assignment five, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Like I said, do start on this sooner rather than later. It should be somewhat interesting. In some ways, it's mainly a systems level project. You're not doing a whole lot of, you're, you're using a lot of libraries to build something interesting. Um, but that the libraries are pretty heavy duty libraries. So they're probably not ones you've touched before. Uh, so you're gonna need to spend some time just familiarizing yourself with it. It took me about 15 man hours, 10 to 15 man hours to go from nothing to a working implementation. Um, and that included the overhead of teaching myself a lot of this stuff as I went along. So your mileage may vary, but you can use that to gauge. It definitely means don't start at 24 hours in advance. Um, start at a while in advance. It's also the kind of thing where you don't want to just be banging your head against errors all at the last minute and marry. You want to be able to take some time off because they come to you in your seat. So your last programming assignment, um, Start. Your last programming assignment is a file systems assignment, where your goal is essentially going to be to implement a little special purpose file system. Um, yeah, using keys for that. Yes, or right, using keys for it, uh, which we'll get into here in a sec. So, just by a quick show of hands, how many people are know how to like manually mount something in Linux? Okay. Guess we're talking about it then. Um, so 
before we get really into the bulk of what the assignment is, let me give you guys a little bit of background just on like the basics of the Linux file abstractions and file system abstraction because understanding that's going to kind of be key to understanding the rest of this. So in Linux, unlike in Windows, you don't have concepts of different drives. You don't have C drive to D drive. You have a single tree. And all hard drives and all files are accessible in that single main space, that single tree. And your tree is always rooted at your slash directory, right? Um, where this is what we just call your root directory. Uh, and underneath this, I mean, in the standard Linux file system, this tree goes down to a whole bunch of other folders. One of these is almost always a home folder. Uh, one of these is the user folder. One of these is the etc. folder, and there are others. Your home folder tends to have a separate folder for each user on the system. So if we're talking about the way your VMs are structured, there's just one user. So this is just user, because that's the user's name. But if you went and looked at the home directory on like one of the C cell machines, there'd be 20 or 30 of these, depending on how many people log into the machine, where these would be UTLNs for each individual. And then inside that folder is whatever files, that's your home directory, right? When you just log in to start, you just do an ls, this is where you're sitting in the file tree and just print out all your files. Um, so in some cases, this can be one single nice, this can all be on one hard drive, right? You can have one hard drive in your system, your hard drive can have a single partition on it. We're not gonna get too much into the concept of partitions, but you can think about that as it's basically a logical way to divide up the physical space of the hard disk. So, you have a single hard disk with a single partition uh, with this mount point sitting on there, all of this data is stored on it. Um, that's one way of doing things. That's often, if that's the case, you have what we call a single mount point, and it's this root point, where essentially the mount point is the way that you connect the underlying file system to this tree. Um, and your root mount point, you always have to have one. You can't boot a system without it. So when you go to boot your system, you just have one hard disk, one of the arguments you pass to Grub is basically a command that tells it which hard drive in your system, which partition this root point should start out as. Um, and it sets that equal to that, and then load your file system from there. Now, if you have two hard drives, or multiple partitions, or more than a single hard drive, on Windows that would show up as separate drives, right? like a C drive and a D drive, they each kind of have their own trees starting at that drive. In Linux, that's not how it works. In Linux, we mount them and we, link them, we do a called linking them into this tree. Um, so essentially, if we wanted to add another hard drive to this system, we could have just an empty folder hanging out here, and we'll just call it there or something. So if we have a new hard drive, like we want to store all my music on it or something, and it's just, we plug it into our system, but by default, it may not mount it anywhere. You go to and everything out and stuff for you. But back in the day, you plug in a hard drive, it's not mounted anywhere. It's connected to the system, but you can't communicate with it yet because you have to do a mount point. So to give something a mount point, you start out by just specifying a, you generally create an empty directory. Because in the process of mounting something, you replace this directory, which is essentially whatever, with essentially whatever is stored on the hard disk we are mounting. Um, so we would create an empty directory. We then call the mount command. So say we have another tree over here. This is our, this is our, our music drive we just plugged into the system. It has a folder called music. And it's divided up into albums and songs. Whatever. It has some folders inside of it. So by itself, it's its own tree sitting on that hard drive. When we plug that hard drive into the system, we want to link this tree into this tree. And that's what mounting does. So we call the mount command. We basically say, this is where I want this tree to get linked in. This is the hard drive that I want to link in. And it will then generate a link where this directory essentially gets replaced by a link from here to there. So now, instead of it would be it's still called whatever the name of this directory is called. Right, so it actually do this. So now when I do slash spare slash music, I actually get all of this. Whereas before, if I did ls spare, I would just get into directory. If I now do ls spare, I'll see music, and I can actually access all of this. So in this way, you can kind of extend your namespace infinitely, right? You can have as many hard drives as you want. You can keep extending them. They all link back to this single file namespace. And this is kind of a unique property of, of POSIX systems, so Unix and Linux. Uh, this is how OS X works, so on and so forth. Um, uh, there is a, your, you have one folder in the root of your partition. You can have as many as you want. There okay. be, is, is that just the way you're indicating? Yeah, I, you would, right. If that was root, it would be called spare. I mean, it's right, so, right, so technically this is, there's like always just a, there's just a root directory period anytime you have a hard drive. So technically what we're doing is we're replacing this with 
this. So, but um, yeah, you can have multiple. You could actually have multiple things here, and then when you did ls spare, you get all of these. So then it's actually it's actually doing something like this, right? Any other questions? Um, so that's the idea behind mounting, where essentially mounting is a way to link together this namespace. Now, you can do interesting things with mounting. So if you're mounting a hard disk, you can, so mounting and linking, we, we generally call it mounting if we're doing it with a physical hard disk, uh, but you can also create links in this system, um, where essentially you can say, this should actually be a pointer back to here. Um, where you can create symbolic links or hard links. We're not going to get into the differences between them, but you can essentially also replace directories. I mean, not only can you link in and you mount new hard disks, which is essentially creating a link to a new physical hard disk, but you can also create links within the system. So now if we did slash, if we did ls slash spare, it would be the same as doing ls to here. So you essentially, I mean, this is a recursive link, but um, you can do things like this. The file system is pretty malleable on a FOSX system. Uh, but it all revolves around a tree with a single top mount point. Everything's accessible in one place. It's going by the names. Questions on this? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about what exactly happens with or how exactly the file systems are structured on your computer. So one of the side effects of being able to tie in all the different hard disks to this single tree is we need all of our hard disks to essentially speak the same language, or we need all of our partitions to, additionally to speak the same language. They all need to know what a directory is, right? I mean, this logical structure, you could you could have a file system that doesn't know what a directory is, in which case this logical structure is completely useless. Um, there's a lot of file systems on Linux. There's ext4 is the most common one deployed right now. ext3, you can use Windows file systems like npfs or fat. You can use network file systems like nfs. Um, I mean, the list goes on. People like to get their PhDs by writing new file systems. So there's way more files. It's like programming languages, right? Um, so there's tons of file systems. Uh, but the cool thing about all these file systems is this abstraction relates to all of them, right? We expect to have directories on all of these. We expect to be able to read and write files. We expect to be able to traverse directories in this manner. Um, how these things are actually implemented differ by block. Uh, they, things like ext4, which is a journaling file system, doesn't really store specific directories. It stores a bunch of data and then stores links to point to it to kind of sort directories in other ways. There's things like NFS or even weirder, right? This is a distributed file system, so it can be spread out over completely separate machines. So this is what it looks, the file system looks like to us, but how it's actually implemented can be completely different. But because we need all of these file systems to essentially look the same to us, because otherwise each of your individual programs would have to know how to handle each of these separately, which would be a pain in the ass. Uh, so Linux has what's called the VFS, or the virtual file system, where essentially the virtual file system is a wrapper or a layer that sits between um, so VFS is essentially a layer that sits between all of your back-end implementations of these file systems and what you're actually seeing, where VFS exposes this common interface, where things like read directory, open, close, read, write, all of these things are essentially calls into VFS. What a read and write means differs a lot by, I mean, a read and write on NFS is going to require calling your network card to send some traffic over the network. A read and write on ext 4 is just going to write directly to the journal on your system. So what a read and write are actually doing differs by a lot. But because we don't want to have to worry about that at this level, we created the, VR, the Linux and Unix, for that matter, this actually dates back to some older Unix systems. Create the VFS, which the goal of which is just to expose a common interface into any of these underlying file systems. Um, so the beauty of this is that we can, we don't necessarily, we can completely abstract away what the actual underlying file system is, which makes it much easier to deploy new file systems, so on and so forth, but I need to change what you can actually do at the application level. People have kind of clear on this thus far? So this image that we're looking at here, where you have the directories, things like inode, so on and so forth, these are all properties of the DFS. There was a time when the way this tree looks here was roughly equivalent to the way that it was actually stored on disk. 
Um, you would have links between these various places, they'd have pointers to where the data was. How it's actually done now differs by a lot, but we still kind of use the way it used to be done with a single tree, so on and so forth, as our now just common interface into whatever's going on behind the scenes. Um, so the way this lives in the kernel is we have our Linux kernel. Um, well, let's make it a little bit smaller. Looks like the Borg. Yeah, right, the Borg cube. Um, <laughs> Underneath our kernel, we have the actual devices on our system, right? So this would be like, maybe our system has two hard disks. We have hard disk one and hard disk two, okay? So these are physical devices that are connected to the motherboard in our system. We're then running Linux on top of it. And inside of Linux, each of these devices, I'm gonna gloss over a few things here, so forgive me, but each of these devices, we can effectively think of them as they're connected to a file system driver. So let's say HD1 is an ext4 file system. So we have the ext4 driver, and it links in here. Maybe HD2, this is maybe our Windows partition, right? It's a dual boot system. So this ties into the NTFS driver, which is the Windows file system. Um, and that basically links in here. Then on top of both of these, we have the BFS linking into both of them. And this is what gets exposed to user space. So we can read or write to what ultimately will end up being completely different systems on completely different hard disks, but to us, it's just reading and writing to essentially different directories in the same file chain. Have I lost people? Okay. So this assignment. When we talk about file systems, we can essentially, traditionally when we talk about a file system, we're talking about things like this, right? We're talking about these low-level kernel drivers whose job it is on one side to basically implement the BSF, BFS abstraction. On the other side, their job is to talk directly to a hard disk and somehow store the data in a manner that allows them to retrieve it later. Um, these are kernel drivers. You basically have a separate driver for each file system. It gets loaded when you mount that. The part of the mount call involves making sure that the kernel module that implements the file system is loaded, so on and so forth. Writing these is great, but it's also very difficult. Uh, one, because you have to work purely in kernel space, and two, because writing to raw hard disk is not something a lot of people have much of a background in. Um, also, if you screw up, you can fork your entire hard disk, right? I mean, this isn't exactly up. We're going to give you guys all a hard disk to play around with kind of assignment. Um, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to create, for the purpose of this assignment, we're essentially creating what's called a mirror file system, where a mirror file system doesn't actually talk to hard disk at all. It kind of side chains in here. And actually, the place it does it is it side chains in here. For this cycle. where it still is talking to DFS and then back up to user space, where essentially our file system, instead of storing its data directly on the hard disk, is just going to store its data on top of the existing file system. So writing to hard disk is no longer our problem. We can now just worry about writing what will our file system will essentially be implemented inside files on top of other uh, on top of an existing file system. On your VM, this is essentially what your virtual hard disk is, right? Your virtual hard disk looks like one big file to your host computer. It's just a file stored on whatever your host operating system is and whatever file system that is. But within that file, there's essentially a system that's divvying up that file into what looks like an actual file system, which is then getting exposed to user space via the regular methods. OK? So this is essentially what you guys are going to be writing. and. The one more trick is you're not actually going to be writing into the kernel. Uh, we're going to be using a library called Fuse that essentially allows you to write this out here. Then Fuse sits right here. And your mirror talks back and forth to the Fuse kernel module, which actually handles all this low-level stuff. The advantage to this is if you're writing something in the kernel, it goes back to that first assignment we did, you're pretty limited on what you can use. You can't really use any of these big application level libraries, so on and so forth. Whereas if you can implement it up in user space, you can get access to a nice lot of nice files or a file level or a lot, lot of nice high level libraries. Now, when you implement something like ext4, which is essentially clever bit bashing on top of a hard disk, you don't necessarily need high level libraries. 
But when you're doing other things, for instance, if any of you guys were familiar with the Google file or the uh, uh, Gmail file system, which was a thing on Linux a little while ago, it doesn't work anymore. It essentially lets you access your Gmail inbox as a mount point on the file system. So when you ls the folder, it would show you all your email, you could read and write, and it would basically send and receive emails, so on and so forth. To do something like that, you definitely don't want to be working in the kernel, right? Talking to Gmail, there's like API on top of API on top of API, and you wouldn't have access to any of those APIs in the kernel, you'd have to bit bash it out. So to do something like that, you always use Fuse, because having access to all of these uh, user level libraries becomes very handy, and for a small performance penalty that is basically this extra communication in and out of the kernel, we can accomplish essentially the same thing. So our file system is a little bit different from traditional file systems in that it's, it's a second level file system. It's actually storing its data on top of a host file system. And we're actually going to be implementing it in user space instead of in kernel space. Any questions on that? All right. So now the question is, well, what is your file system supposed to do? And the answer to that is, you guys are going to be writing a file system that essentially wraps encryption around an underlying file system. Um, so traditionally, when you have a file on Linux, it's not encrypted, right? You have some protection, you have your mode bits, other users of the system, you can make sure they can't read them. But that only works in so much as the system is up and running and the operating system is there to enforce it. If someone pops out the hard disk on your laptop and plugs it into another Linux system that isn't actually running its operating system from there, they can read any file they want. It's not actually going to check the node bits. You can, you can tell the system to ignore all of that. Um, so when you really want something to be secure, you have to actually encrypt it. Because then, regardless of what they're doing, whether or not the file system is enforcing any permissions or anything like that, if it's encrypted, yeah, they can read it at the end of the day, but what are they reading? They're just going to be reading a bunch of encrypted gibberish, or so one hopes. So that's the way our file system is going to work, where essentially we'll ignore this diagram for now. Where essentially your file system, so traditionally, say, we have somewhere in your home folder here. Say you have a directory in your home folder, and we're just going to call it uh, my stuff, right? Where traditionally when we read this, when we call read or write on this, it just calls directly into the VFS. This is going to go into the VFS, which is going to go into whatever file system driver happens to be appropriate, which is going to go to the actual hard disk itself, right? What we're going to essentially do is we are adding one step, uh, kind of a side, yeah, one step inside here. So with our file system, it's still going to talk to DFS because that's everything user space talks. But our fuse module is actually going to implement essentially our encryption wrapper. Which is then actually going to talk back to DFS which will then talk to the file system driver and talk to the hard disk. So that if we mount this, if we just look at this folder by itself, like it's not mounted through, so this is a special file system, we can mount it essentially. So if, this, if our file system isn't mounted, we look at this folder, we see a bunch of files, but each of them is encrypted. You can't read them. So you try to read or write them, you just get a bunch of gibberish. But if you mount this folder through this file system, so you essentially add this chunk into the chain, then when you read and write this folder, your files look perfectly normal. Because whenever you do a read command, it's going to decrypt it for you. Whenever you do a write command, it's going to encrypt it for you before it actually goes and hits the backend files with this stuff stored. So that's kind of the goal is you're going to write a file system that when you mount the file system, you give it a mount point, because you do everything mount point. You tell it what folder you essentially want it to mirror. And then when you access that folder through your new mount point, it's going to apply encryption in both directions. Um, when you access the folder directly, instead of through your mount point, you're just going to get gibberish because it'll be encrypted. Does this make sense? Complete directory structure as well. Uh, it'll be extra credit. That gets significantly more complicated. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, okay. So this, what you're implementing is essentially what we call uh, file side encryption, which is one of two ways we generally do encryption on operating systems. The other side is doing full disk encryption, where instead of having your encryption set here, you essentially make your encryption set here. Um, 
That's a lot harder to do and requires low-level stuff that you have to work in the kernel, so on and so forth, and you have to integrate <coughs> everything instead of just a specific directory. So what we're doing is we're doing it on a per-file basis where it'll essentially encrypt or decrypt a single directory. So if there aren't any more questions on this, I'll pull down the screen and we'll look at some actual examples of what's going on. Here. Okay. Um, so one last thing before I pull on the down the screen. I said this is mainly a systems level kind of implementation project because you got to deal with a bunch of. I mean, realistically, you're going to end up writing, if you do it right, maybe two or three hundred lines of your own code. Uh, it's which two hundred or three hundred lines of your code you write that becomes the difficult part, right? A lot of the heavy lifting is done for you in these libraries. You just have to pull together all the pieces and assemble them in a cohesive manner. Uh, which can be really fun when you do it right or really frustrating when you do it wrong because you weren't the guy that wrote the back end. But um, a few things you'll need to pay attention to. The way we do this, this is all Fuse. So you're going to need to learn the Fuse API, which is what we're going to start by looking at here in a little bit. Uh, our encryption, we're actually going to do using OpenSSL. So you'll need to, uh, less so, I actually, there's some nice wrapper functions for you, but essentially you'll need to know a little bit about the OpenSSL crypto library because that's what's actually going to be encrypting and decrypting things. And then there's one additional requirement to this. If this folder has an unencrypted file in it, we want our file system to still handle that appropriately. We don't want to try to decrypt an unencrypted file because that will just return gibberish too. So we essentially are going to use what's called extended attributes to add a flag to every file that tells us whether or not it's encrypted, which then tells this to either decrypted or encrypted, or if it's not encrypted, this basically just passes it straight on uh, and doesn't worry about doing anything at all. So the three libraries you need to deal with are OpenSSL. Uh, X attributes aren't really a library. They're built into Linux, but they're terribly documented. Uh, so there's some examples to look at that today, too. And then the Fuse library, which is where you're going to That's the library you're really going to need to know the most, because that's where you actually do your implementation. OK? Everything I'm saying today will be in a hopefully nice write-up this evening, too. So there'll be plenty of pointers to where you can find documentation. Don't feel like you have to take this all in. but. Do try to get a feel for the flavor and the overview because that's what will benefit you. And you at least need to know where to look, uh, even if you don't necessarily catch everything that's going on here. That's the projector that's not. So, as it comes on, um, this is a little bit like a diagram we're looking at. This is essentially on the Fuse website. This is just their home page. has some basic documentation on how Fuse works. But like we said, Fuse kind of lives as this side chain plug into the DFS that exposes itself to our user programs so we can write things in user space that then talk to the Fuse interface, which plays basically implements our file system for us inside the kernel without us having to actually work in the kernel directly. Um, the Fuse documentation is okay for an open source project. Um, your biggest helps here are going to be there's a, there's a deoxygen dump on here that basically has everything about everything you want to know about the individual functions you need to be using. This is where you want to come for details. There's also a Fuse Wiki, which the examples I'm going over today are kind of pulled off the Fuse Wiki, and it goes into a lot of in-depth description of them. So if my very brief description today doesn't satisfy you, Go check out the Fuse Wiki. There's a link to it uh, and somewhere along here. Um, and uh, yeah, a link to it down here. And it has an even more in-depth discussion time about these examples. I'll give you a flavor of exactly what's going on. So the first thing we need to deal with in Fuse is so is the wiki was the Fuse that I set for that. Oh uh, yeah, it's a search for the wiki. It's all on there. Um, so there's a number of examples here. This is, this is essentially the files you're going to be starting with. These just represent a whole bunch of examples that will hopefully make your life a little bit easier, as well as the executables that they build here. So the very first thing we'll look at is, you know, your classic and terribly overused Hello World example using the Fuse file system, where essentially this is a file system. So when you compile a Fuse program, it essentially builds an executable where the executable is the mounting tool for that file system. So when we run this executable, it's not like it's actually going to run the file system, but it is going to mount the file system for us uh, with the appropriate and basically point it at all of our functions that are coded. We'll look at the coding here in a sec, but 
The way the fuse hello system works is we essentially announce on top of a directory. It then places like a virtual file inside that directory called hello. When we try to read that virtual hello file, it spits out hello world at us, right? That's all it does. You can't write to it. You can't really do anything fancy. You can't add files to it. It just has this one virtual file. It's not even a mirroring file system. This hello file isn't even getting stored anywhere. It exists merely and it gets auto-generated every time we call read, right? When we call read hello, the backend system builds this file and hands it to us. So it's not actually stored anywhere at all. So if we look at, I have these three folders here that I'm just using as mount points. There's nothing special about making a folder for a mount point. You just use the make directory command. Uh, these are all, you, you want them to be empty. It's not that you'll erase anything if they aren't empty, but you'll lose access to it. Because whenever we mount something on one of these, you replace wherever it was pointing before. So when you unmount it, you'll get back to whatever's stored outside the directory, but you lose whatever. You never mount something on top of a non-empty directory. It's just bad practice. Um, so if we look at these directories, and we'll look at the mount hello directory. I'll run ls on it. Oh, it's still mounted. So we will unmount it. There's some tools you're going to need to install. There'll be a list of dependencies. They're not already on the wiki, but it's a pseudo app to install them. One of them is this um, this fuse mount utility, where essentially this is how we can unmount. You can also mount through it, but normally you mount through the executables. Uh, so I'm going to unmount that. Fuse mount is that's for unmounting, right? Because we can unmount any. Using the file system yeah. at this point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because the these the executables and generates are only mounters, they're not yeah. unmounters, so you gotta use the utility to mount. Okay, so ignore the last 30 seconds. If I now look at that, if I do an LS on my mount encrypted on my mount hello directory, it returns as empty. There's nothing in the directory, right? We're just looking at empty directories. So now I actually want to mount this fuse file system and mount it on top of that directory. So Again, the, the executables are essentially mounters. So I'm going to call the executable fuse hello. This is a tool that just mounts on my fuse hello file system. I need to pass it one flag, or I need to pass it one argument. That's essentially where my mount point is. So I'm going to mount this on top of mount hello. I could just as easily mount it on any other empty directory. This is just the one that's labeled nicely for it. So I'm going to do mount hello. And now if I rerun that ls command a minute ago, I get one file. If we do ls-l. We can see some details on it. It's owned by root. Owned by root, right? It's not even a real file. This is all just auto-generated every time I call it. It only has read permissions, and it has a timestamp that reflects the Unix epoch, um, <laughs> which is what you get if you feed zero into a time command. So uh, if we now try to read that, so I'm going to go ahead and Cat my mount hello and then cat the hello file, I get this hello world spin back, right? Um, if I try to write to it, so I do an echo. I get a permission denied. Write was never even implemented, and to help enforce that, the file system is only returning read permissions. Uh, if I do a sudo, Yeah, yeah, I can't. You can't actually get around it. Um, I don't actually do this, but it'll give me a uh, an implementer. error. So if I try to bypass that, cannot write, and I run. Now you see why I changed my prompt. Yeah, it still it doesn't let me do it. So it, there really is no right even implemented. So um, if, can you change my start what would happen if you change my it'll, it'll it'll give me a not implemented. Um, um, that's an even cooler command than CHMOD. <laughs> So if I perform a hello file, function not implemented. And this so, is talking to via VFF and views to yours and your Yeah, well, so whenever I call this, it's calling the standard system calls, uh, right, which call into VFS. Fuse is then basically intercepting them, giving me the chance to rewrite them. 
and then returning whatever the result is. So you just have to implement this and you get the default. Yeah, so Fuse has some default handlings uh, like that uh, that'll spit out pretty things. I mean, Fuse makes you like each other. Right. So we look at the implementation for this, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the Fuse hello.c file. We'll scroll straight down to the bottom because that's where the most interesting part is. This is essentially the core to implementing any Fuse file system. Is the VFS is a very object-oriented concept on Linux. It's essentially, anytime you mount a file, even in the kernel, the Fuse interface is surprisingly similar to the kernel interface. So don't think that we're doing this in user space because it gives you access to extra libraries, not because it's really all that different. You can move this into kernel space pretty simply, and so you have to excise all of your user space libraries. Um, so the way that VFS works, whenever whether you're implementing ASD4 or whether you're implementing this, is you essentially have to, it gives you the struct of all the possible VFS operations, where members of the struct are function pointers. So we dealt with some function pointers in, uh, in CS2400. The essential gist is we can point, the, we can access, we can essentially use variables to point to functions. Um, so there's a whole list of these. They're on the Fuse website. Uh, essentially, all of the possible, and it's the same for VFS. So these are basically all the possible functions that VFS knows. So to really do a perfect implementation, you would write implementations for every one of these function pointers. Uh, this Hello World's obviously a small subset of those, but the way it works is we essentially we coded these four functions. We then have to basically set the pointers to the corresponding VFS functions to our functions. And then every time VFS needs to do an open, it's going to call our hello open. Or every time it needs to do a read, it's going to call our hello read. So it's essentially allowing us to implement our, I mean, it's, it's uh, we're essentially overriding the built-in functions with our own versions, right? Um, we obviously are just implementing these four. This is kind of the core you need to do what we just did. Open and read are obviously what you need to actually read that hello program. Whenever you execute cat on something, it opens it first and then it reads it. The ls command needs these two. So read directory gives you a list of files in it, and then the get attributes gives you the attributes, like the read, the basically this is the permission, timestamp, all of that stuff for each file. So these are the core four files you need to kind of handle the very basics. Obviously, so chmod is another one of these. It's obviously not implemented. Writes one of these. It's not implemented either. Um, so on and so forth. Our main function then becomes pretty simple. It's basically just a pass fuse, it's a fuse, fuse main function where, again, you pass it the fuse arguments from your chain. You might have your own arguments that you want to parse off the beginning, and you probably will for your purposes because you need to pass it some additional information. But for the bare basics of you don't need to pass in any additional information, you just pass through your argc and your argv directly with the fuse. It then pulls off essentially the mount point from there. You pass it a copy, so this struct that we filled up with pointers to our functions, we're passing a copy of that, and then you can actually give us some flags, which we don't really need to worry about. It starts passing it all. So this is what it takes to implement Fuse, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, the crux then lies in, well, what each of these functions actually does. And this example has gone through in great detail on the wiki, so I'm not going to talk about it too much, but if we essentially look up here at some of these structs, um, so if we look at our implementation of open, these are standard prototypes. These are essentially defined in that fuse file. Uh, you have your prototypes obviously have to match you have the wrong function pointers into the compile time error. Um, but these are what the system's going to pass you. It'd be the same thing you pass in the kernel. You always get passed a copy of this path. This is a string that basically it's your path to your current file. So for us, this would be slash home, slash user, slash a sailor, slash dropbox, and then all the way out to the working directory where I essentially have the file we're talking about. This is then some local data that gets passed to much use functions, so you can, if you need to store some additional data in there, you can. Um, it's pretty straightforward when we do an open. It makes sure that we are trying to open the actual hello file. This is just hard coded at the top, this is a constant. Um, so if we try to open any file other than that hello file, it's going to throw us an error, and then we make sure that we're only opening it for reading. So this is why we always get a right error. Uh, anytime we try to open it for writing, this is not a read-only flag, and it also throws the access error. Um, these other functions do some slightly more complicated things, mainly because they're having to build that file from scratch every time you try to read it, like we talked about. Your functions are actually even easier to implement than this, because unlike this, you're not building any files from scratch, you just need to call the corresponding operation on the existing file. So questions on this before we go on to that example? 
Okay. So if we look at an example of that concept, that's our um, so I'm going to unmount the A1 file system, which is just this fuser mount dash u command. And now if we look at that mount point again, well, it's empty. So now we're back to where we started. So there's a second fuse file system here called fuse XMP, fuse example, where this is an example of a mirroring file system. Essentially what this does is wherever you mount this, it just mirrors your root directory. So you will have an additional copy of your root directory. It's not really a copy. You'll have a pointer back to your root folder wherever we end up mounting this. Whenever you do an action on one of the files in there, it just does the action on the original file directly. So if we look at this real quick, we'll go ahead and run it. Use example. We need to give it a mount point. So I'm going to mount it on mount XMP, which is also just an empty directory. Uh, and select so, whether it's not an empty directory. This one's already mounted too. Okay. This is what happens when you have a second recitation. Okay. So now if I look at that directory, it's an empty directory, and if I run my mount command, it's going to go ahead and mount it. Now when I look at that directory, I essentially just get a copy of my root directory. So this is the exact thing as doing a less root, right? So if we look at the implementation of this, and I could actually read or write files. I mean, this actually implements pretty much everything. So I could access any of these files through that mount point if I wanted to. Um, so if we look at code for this, so again, I'm going to go down to the very bottom because that's where the interesting part starts out. Uh, it, it implements almost everything, not quite. And there's, uh, yeah, you can get away with that action. Yeah. So if we look at the struct this time, it's far fuller than the struct last time, but the concept's the same. We basically, members of this struct, if this, this is how you initialize, this is a way of initializing a struct in C99. Those may not be familiar with this syntax, but it's essentially saying this struct dot this pointer is equal to these values, where these values are the pointers to our actual functions. Um, so again, we're implementing the act. We're implementing pretty much everything this time. Uh, everything you need to implement the handle file, we implement both read and write. All of these are pointers back to our original files. Our main, again, basically doesn't do anything. It just passes through our CRV, passes it the pointer to the struct, and then it gives it no flags. And if we look at some of these, so this is going to look, this is probably where you guys would want to start for your assignment. Because if we look at one of these, right, so so if we look at something like open, this is literally just a wrapper for the system called open. So we have a return value. We then call open on path. So this path always starts out wherever our mount directory is. So our mount directory, essentially our path is starting with a slash for the mount directory, which is why when we pass it to the actual system call, we're just getting the root directory. Um, so this is you get the root directory by default, and you don't do anything else to path. Um, so we're just calling open on regular path. We're passing it any flags that we might have gotten via this struct here. If there's an error, we basically pass it on, and then we return to this one. Read does essentially the same thing. We open up the file. We call the underlying read command, passing it essentially the same things that our command got passed. And then we close the file and return the appropriate value for read. So these are pretty lightweight wrappers for um, pretty lightweight wrappers for just the underlying system calls, which is why this is just a basic mirror file system. Now, there's different ways of doing this. You'll notice that for every read, it's actually doing an open and a close. That's not necessarily standard. This is a, it's, this is stateless, right? It's avoiding having to have it opened earlier and then maintain the file pointer, so on and so forth. You may actually find you want to, may want to do that. There's actually a copy. You can store a copy of the file pointer in here. So. You could rearrange this so your open was done. I mean, there's an open function. So your open was done in open. The file descriptor actually gets stored in here. Then you wouldn't do the open and close here. You would just do the read. You'd pull the file descriptor out of that struct because that stack can get past every function. So on and so forth. To avoid confusion, this just did the stateless version, which is inefficient because it has to have all these extra calls for open and close, but it works just fine. Um, 
you can kind of pile those on the side. Uh, it'll talk about some of the write up. It does the same thing for write, it does an open corresponding write. Some things are really simple, like stat.fs is literally just, I mean, we're literally just passing things directly through and passing through an error. Um, so this is what a wrapper file system looks like. It's long, but only because there's a lot of functions that has to do this kind of bare minimum wrapper for it. Uh, there's not actually a lot going on in here. So this is probably where you guys want to start, um, because you're going to want to have essentially, I mean, you want to start with a mere file system anyway. Realistically, you have to touch every function, we'll come to that in a minute, but the functions you only have to touch a lot are to, to do encryption, you only really have to touch three or four functions significantly. Um, you can either do encryption on the read and write, in which case you basically take the mirror version and you've added, you've added decryption stuff on read and that encryption stuff on write, or you do it on open and close. And you, every time it opens, you decrypt, every time it closes, you decrypt. So there's really only a couple of functions you really have to modify. Now, we don't, your file system you guys are writing, you don't want it to mirror the root directory, you want it to mirror a specific directory. So you will pass through an additional argument of the directory that you want it to mirror. And then you essentially, in every one of these functions, you're going to have to do a little transformation on the path. Where essentially you'll need to take the path, you'll need to prepend it with whatever your mirror point is, and then call the open on that. And that's basically just, I mean, you can write a quick function that takes in this path, basically applies that simple transformation to get to whatever mirror point was passed in, and then just keeps going. So you are going to have to touch every function that uses path, but it's pretty lightly to touch. It's just adding some simple translation to make this path reflect your mirror directory instead of the root directory, which is what it reflects by the wall. Are we going to be obfuscating file names? Um, no. I mean, I get extra credit. No, that's also awesome. Yeah. So often when you do encryption, you, you don't want people, you want people to know the names of your files as well as their contents. Um, so you could actually play with that, but it gives you a Kind of overview questions on this. Just about out of time. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time to go over them, but also in this folder, there's an encryption example. Um, this AES script basically calls into this .h file is where the heavy lifting is done, and it's basically just a single function called docrypt, where you pass it an input file pointer, you pass it an output file pointer. This is a flag that tells it if it's a one, it encrypts, if it's a zero, it decrypts, if it's a negative one, it just copies straight through, it doesn't do anything. Um, and then this is a key, basically a string, that's what it builds its key off of. So you can use this for me. You probably want to use this for the encryption. This actually makes the calls to the open SSL functions underneath it. All these EDP functions are open SSL library functions. This is set up to do 256-bit AES encryption, which is pretty state-of-the-art. So I mean, for symmetric encryption, it's pretty state-of-the-art. So if you want to start messing, I mean, if you want to do clever things with encryption, you're welcome to. You have to mess around in here. Don't start there, because learning open SSL on top of learning to use is not necessarily worth all of your time. Um, you can either pull these concepts out if you want a different type of function, or you can just, every time you need to do conversion, render it in the terms of file pointers and just call this function. Um, you can include this other file, so on and so forth. If you want to play around, there's this little AES script program that's basically just a wrapper around it. Um, this will just let you encrypt and decrypt files. So again, you just pass it, this is just your flag. You can look at the C file, it's .c for, uh, .e for encrypt, .e for decrypt, .c for copy. This is a key, if you're encrypting and decrypting, you obviously need to give it something there. And then your input and output paths for files. Um, so you can play with that if you just want to make sure your encryption is working on its own. The additional thing is there's this x attributes utils function, which essentially we talked about, we want to be able to know, we want to add a flag to each file to tell us whether or not it's encrypted. This is a little utility that'll let you basically read all the flags associated with the file or manually write through the file, so on and so forth. You would never use, I mean, your file system not use this utility, but you can go into the source code for this utility, pull out the relevant portions that read and write those flags, and basically put them into your actual views implementation. So you have examples of all the libraries you need to use, X attributes. Um, this is the better open SSL one to look at. This is a higher level, this is a, this is, doesn't work on files, this works on like individual bytes, so. This is probably the easier one to look at, and you have several few examples to look at. The one last note, because it's an easy trap to fall into, uh, AES encryption, which is what this is set to use by default, is stateful. So you can't start in the center. Uh, if you have an entire encrypted file, you can't start decrypting it in the center. You can't add new encrypted data in the center. You either have to encrypt the whole file or you have to decrypt the whole file. 
lots of times you're going to read and write calls to the center of the file, right? If it's the fourth write call you've gotten and they're like going through the file 10 bytes at a time, you're somewhere in the center of the file. So this is something you need to think about. You can't just encrypt those 10 bytes and stick them in the center of the file. It doesn't work that way. You'll get something, but it won't be unencryptable. Um, so what you actually need to do is every time you need to write anywhere in the file, you need to essentially decrypt the whole file. You need to write your bytes in the appropriate place, re-encrypt the whole file, and then move on. Or if you want to be more clever, instead of doing it read write all, you just do it in open and close. So when you open a file, you basically create like a second temporary file that's the unencrypted version. You reroute all of your reads and writes to that, and when they close the file, you re-encrypt that and delete the unencrypted version. So there's a couple of ways of handling this, but do know you got to deal with the whole file at a time when you're doing this kind of encryption, um, because each byte you encrypt is dependent upon the previous byte you encrypted. So if you start in the center, you screw everything up. Uh, if you haven't had a crypto class, that's something to watch out for. Uh, just know when you do encryption, decryption, if you find yourself not doing it on the entire file at a time, you're probably doing something wrong. Related question about we don't have to support huge files like big white files. Uh, probably not. I'm not going to test it on the my implementation is super inefficient right now. So it supports few of the files, but it's ridiculously slow. Uh, so this is a real iterative process, guys. You got a few core things you got to do. First thing, you basically have to take this fuse example and change it so it, instead of mounting the root directory, it mounts a specific folder. After that, you might want to go about adding encryption. After that, go about adding the actual flags. Um, where you'll note the copy mode in here is handy if it's an unencrypted file, right? You just copy it through instead of actually trying to uh, encrypt it or decrypt it. So do take this one step at a time. Make sure each step works before you move on to the next one, or you're gonna find yourself in way too deep. So build all the examples, get familiar with them, make sure they work. Then focus on mounting this folder, make sure that works. So on and so forth. This will be up tonight. Thanks a lot, guys. You can post on the discussion board if you have questions. Make sure you're signed up for PA4 grading sessions.